You're watching the Spirit Food Christian Center Worldwide Webcast, broadcasting live every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time. Yes, amen, hallelujah. When Spirit Food comes to you, blessings will flow. Say yes. And that which I'm holding in my heart, the holy written word of God, the Bible is God speaking to me. I am what the Word of God says I am. I can do what the Word of God says I can do. I have what the Word of God says I possess. I am a believer, not a doubter. Therefore, God's Word is being confirmed in my life with signs following in Jesus name amen hallelujah and amen at this time all of the adults you may be able to sit down and the youth I want you to be prepared to go to your classes we have classes for you so all the adults reach your hands towards our youth and say these words in Jesus name you will be blessed and you will receive the Word of God, in Jesus' name, amen. Young people, go ahead and have a great time in your classes. I'd like for everyone who's here, please be mindful that this is an opportunity for you to learn. So if you don't have a Bible, elevate your hands. The ushers will be glad to pass the Bible to you. I don't want anyone to miss out on the wonderful Word of the living God. The scripture says in Psalms, 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Why should we taste and see that the Lord is good? Because we'll be blessed by trusting in him. All right, everyone, open your Bibles, please, to James chapter 5, James the fifth chapter. And we're going to look at these wonderful scriptures as we talk about the subject of how to pray effectively how to pray effectively. In James chapter five, we're instructed from the word of God that in verse 16, James chapter five, verse 16, we're told that it's important for us to pray and our prayers make a difference. In James chapter five, in verse 16, the scripture says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now here he's saying that the effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Another translation reads it this way. The heartfelt Fired up prayer of a righteous is dynamic in its working. That means we're encouraged to pray because our prayers will make a difference. We will have a change based upon our willingness and then our follow through in praying. Now, as we're talking about the fervent effectual prayers of a righteous man, it availeth much. Someone would ask the question, well, that means I have to find a righteous person. Well, in Christ Jesus, who is your Lord and your Savior, you are called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus took your place. He took your sin. He took your faults. And he took it to the cross and he died for us. And when he was risen from the dead, he rose for our justification because he is justified and death could not hold him in the grave. And God identifies us in Christ Jesus. So when he died for our sins, then God says, Gary, your sins were crucified when Jesus was crucified. You died when Christ died. 
And when he rose from the dead, you rose from the dead. When he ascended up on high and is now seated at my right hand in the heavenly places, God the Father says, I see you seated at my right hand in Christ Jesus in heavenly places. So Jesus' victory is our victory. And therefore, we are called the righteousness of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we're going to identify 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. This scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, for he, that's God, hath made, hath is the old English word for has, for God has made him, him is referring to Jesus, for God has made him to be sin for us. Now you see the word us there? You could put your name there because it would be appropriate. Us is referring to all of us who have received Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. So God the Father made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, or Gary, by me personally, you personally. And it says, who knew no sin. Now, who knew no sin is referring to Jesus, who was made to be sin. Jesus had never sinned. Therefore, when it says, who knew no sin, it refers to Jesus that never sinned was willing to be made sin with our sin. He took our place. That we, why would you do that, Jesus? That we, or you could say me, or you could use your name and refer to yourself, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Can we all agree that because Jesus Christ died on our behalf, was crucified, can we all agree that he took our place? Can we all agree that he who knew no sin was made sin with our sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God in him? Or we could say it this way, Jesus Christ, who was made righteous and rose from the dead, can we agree that we were made righteous with his righteousness? And the answer to that question would be yes. So when the scripture says in James chapter 5 <clears throat> that the fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man availeth much, he's talking about all of us who are in Christ Jesus. When we pray, our prayers will affect a change. Now, because of that, should we pray? Should we be people engaged in praying? Yes. The Bible lets us know in the Gospel of Luke that men ought to always pray. pray. And when I say men, that's women as well as men who are in Christ Jesus. Men ought to always pray and not faint. That means don't give up. Why shouldn't I give up? Well, in the scriptures, turn to Jeremiah 33. Jeremiah chapter 33, and we'll look at verse 3. Jeremiah is an Old Testament scripture. And the people under the Old Testament, they could believe God and they would have righteousness imputed unto them, meaning that when you pray and you talk to God like God is listening, you're acting like you're a person who's able and you have a right to talk to God. And therefore, when Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3, God speaks to the people of Israel who were not born again, but he tells them this, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. God says, I want you to call unto me. I want you to talk to me. I want you to request unto me your desires. Why? Because I will answer you. So can you all put your hand over your heart and say this? God tells me he wants me to pray. And therefore I will respond and I will pray in Jesus' name.
Have you ever heard of the statement, which is from the Bible, you have not because you ask not? How many of you ever heard of that? Raise your hand. You have not because you ask not. Are you aware that far too many believers in Christ Jesus are not experiencing the effective power of God working in their lives because they're not what? They're not asking. They're not asking. And if they would ask, God would move on their behalf. But the enemy, the devil, tries to get believers to think that they are to be sin conscious. What that means is you're not perfect. So what gives you the right to pray and to ask God for an, an answer to a request that you could make? So too many Christians are sin conscious. They're thinking about their own natural works and imperfections, and therefore they're like, oh Lord, I don't want to pray, because you know what, I've been walking perfectly like I should, and I know I should be perfect, so God just have mercy on me, I'm a worm, I'm climbing under the doorway, and you know, just, if you can give me just a crumb, Lord, I'll be okay, and the Lord is like, who is this? It's not my child. God says, call unto me, and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things which you knew not. God tells you, make your request. How many of you have children? Do you love your children? You provide for your children? When they're at home, do they have to ask you to go to the refrigerator and get a cold glass of water? Oh, mama, daddy, can I just get a little cold glass of water? Just pour a little bit in my palm, I'll be okay. You'd look at them and say, what's wrong with you, child? Why? Because even though they're not perfect, they're your children. Even though they're not perfect, they're your children. And the desire of a parent is to look after the well-being of their children. And that's why when Jesus says we're to pray, he says, don't you pray like people who are not in the family of God. You better talk to your father like you belong to him because he belongs to you and he loves you and he knows you're not perfect. That's the reason why he sent his son Jesus to die for you because you're not perfect. He didn't die for himself. He died for you to take your place so that when he looks at you, he sees you in Christ Jesus. He sees you in in a position of righteousness and therefore as one who's in right standing with God make your request talk to your daddy because he loves you now there are people that don't understand the time references in prayer and because they're they don't understand the time references in prayer for example when Jesus talked to his disciples and he was walking around in Jerusalem and the various areas there, he had not yet gone to the cross. And since he had not yet gone to the cross and he had not died, he had not been raised from the dead, he had not ascended up on high and seated at the right hand of the Father. And, our, and, and humanity at that time did not have the blood sacrifice of Jesus that would make them righteous. Therefore, when he talked to the Jewish people, he was talking to them as one who was a fellow Jew, as one who talked about the covenant of Abraham, and God told Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to do these things for you. Not because Abraham was perfect, but because God offered Abraham these promises, and Abraham said, I'll receive that, thank you very much. Now, Jesus then talk, talked to the Jewish people and said, you have a right to talk to God as your father, but they knew that they were not yet changed in their heart. So when he talked to them, they were unsaved, non-born again people talking to the God of Abraham and they were required to act like they were in covenant with God through the covenant of circumcision and God giving Abraham promises. And Jesus walked around 
with them, known as the son of David, known as one who was a Jew from the tribe of Judah. And so Jesus was identified as a Jewish man in the office of a prophet carrying out the will of God by the ability of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, when Jesus said to the Jewish brethren that were with him, he said, pray in this fashion. Our father, this is Matthew chapter six. Are you there? Matthew, the sixth chapter. And he says uh, here in Matthew chapter six in verse nine, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, talking to them under the Old Testament as a Jewish prophet with Jewish people. He said, after this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Verse 13 of Matthew 6. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, did you all, let's all read that out loud together. There have been people that love to sing that song. And in the top of your Bible on that verse of scripture, it may say the Lord's Prayer. But really, it's not how the Lord wants us to pray in this day in time after the ascension, after the resurrection. Why? Because we are born again people alive unto God. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So in this time period after the resurrection, we're to talk to our father directly because Jesus told us, in that day, what day? The day after the crucifixion and resurrection. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. What day? The day after the resurrection. And in that day, which is about 2,000 years now, he says, in that day, you shall ask me nothing. But you can pray to your father yourself, and he'll hear you. Why? Because he loves you. Why? Because he dwells in you. But when you pray, pray in my name. So let's read Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. And in the middle of that verse of scripture, it says, our father. Let's read it together and keep on reading. Our father, come on, everybody. Our father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now he's talking to Jewish people, his Jewish family, the nation of Israel, letting them know this is how you're to pray under this dispensation. But now, in this time period, after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, turn over to the Gospel of John. Look at this. The Gospel of John. And we'll look at this wonderful verse of Scripture. Hallelujah. Look at the 16th chapter. Verse 23. Gospel of John, verse 23. Now, if you know that I didn't write your Bible, raise your hand. Again, how come you're not raising your hand? If you know that I did not write your Bible, raise your hand. If you don't raise your hand, you just don't care about reacting with me, interaction with me at all. Okay, here's what I'm saying. I want you not to get into a religious boat where you just start saying, when well, you're touching a sacred cow, you know, don't touch the sacred cow. You're telling me I'm not to pray according to Matthew chapter six, our father, which are in heaven. I'm telling you that prayer had application for Old Testament 
believers that were not Christian, but they were under a Jewish covenant and they had the covenant of Abraham, but yet they were Jewish people. And those who were under that covenant did not have the experience of being born again. They were not made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Blood had not been shed by him who is the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. His blood was not shed yet. So all have sinned and come short of the glory of God for all of humanity. But the Jews were a special people that God could work with because of Abraham's covenant. But they were looking forward to the time where God would give them a new heart, a new nature. And that in the time that they would have a new nature, then they would not be looked upon as a sinner. They would be looked upon by God as one who is righteous and who has a right to come to him because God does not impute unto you or look at you and count your sins against you. God looks at you through Christ Jesus and says, yes, my daughter, yes, my son, what do you desire? Even though you're not perfect. Even though you've made mistakes. And you may think, well, if I do that, how's God going to give me an answer to prayer when I'm not perfect? Because he's not answering your prayer based upon you. He's answering your prayer based upon his son who dwells in you. And you have a right to that account of coming to him in prayer. In Hebrews, the Bible says that when you come, you're to come boldly. Well, look at that. We're there in John's gospel, the 16th chapter. You there? Verse 23. And that day... Everybody say, that's the day that we live in now. In that day, you shall ask me nothing. Who's talking? Jesus is talking. Verily, verily, which means truthfully, truthfully, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Again, I'm reminding you, I didn't write it, but I certainly can read it and I certainly can make the decision to believe it and embrace it. Jesus is talking to me. Everyone say, Jesus is talking to me. And in that day, you shall ask me nothing. And he was referring to the time of his resurrection. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Now he's talking to the Jewish people at that time. He's letting them know up, up until this time, you've not prayed and asked God as I'm talking to you now about what's going to happen in that day. Up until now, you've not come and asked the Father in my name in prayer. Verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. How many of you know that it's wonderful to have answered prayer? I mean, if you ask for what you desire and what you desire is fulfilled, it does something to you. It's like, whoo, glory to God, hallelujah. My father has given me what it is I ask him and I'm grateful for it. It's good to have answered prayer. And notice he says the attitude of our father is this, that your joy may be full. How many Christians are walking around with the sourpuss face Acting like, well, I guess I got to crunch it through in life. I got to try to make it the best way I can. Oh, Lord, if you can, maybe you will. I'm not sure. And Jesus said, uh-uh, no, 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 no. In this day and time, after his resurrection, whatever you ask your father in his name, he'll give it to you. Why will he do it? That your joy may be full. It should just bring a smile on your face to know this is how our Lord and our Savior wants us to relate with our Father. 
Because when he came up from the grave and he appeared to his disciples, and particularly to Mary, he said, Mary, go and tell the disciples I'm alive and well. And then he said, I'm going to my father, your father. I'm going to my God, your God. So it is appropriate for us to say, the father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is my father. The God and Father of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is my God and my Father, the creator of the heavens and the earth who knows everything, who's all powerful. My God has invited me to come and ask him for what I desire. And is there anything too hard for God? No. So the question is, why aren't more Christians running around with joy and a pep in their step, looking like they just ran into an ice cream truck <laughs> or, or a candy factory. Could it be that not many Christians are aware that Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Let's read on further. Verse 24 of John's Gospel, the 16th chapter. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. These things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. Verse 26. At that day you shall ask in my name. And I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. You see what Jesus is declaring unto them that were with him in his day? He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to be raised from the dead. And at that time, you can go to God, your Father, yourself. And don't ask me to pray for you because I have given you free access to the Father. We have the ability to go to our Heavenly Father in Christ Jesus and say, Father, I know you hear me when I pray. Why? Because you told me to come unto you. And you said to ask of you and you would answer me and show me great and mighty things which I knew not before. So when I come to you and pray, I just want you to know this. I'm expecting to get up from my position of prayer. If you bow your knee or if you're lying in bed or if you just bow your head or if you just talk to him under your voice. When I finish praying, I know it's done. Thank you very much in Jesus' name. That's a beautiful way to pray. Now, somebody would say, well, that's wonderful for the New Testament Christian to have that. But did people under the Old Testament understand how to pray in faith? Yeah, they did. Because the, the, the term faith is not referring to a denomination. The word faith is the word in the Greek pistos, which means to trust, have confidence in, to rely upon. And there were those under the Abrahamic covenant that say, look, God will keep his word. And under the Old Testament, they knew that God promised, I will be your shield and your buckler. I will be the one who looks after you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Any tongue that rises up in judgment shall be condemned. The people got a hold of that under the Old Testament that weren't even born again, like Daniel. Daniel said, King, you got to keep your word. They said that they want me thrown into the lion's den because I pray to the living God. King, you keep your word, but God's going to keep his word to me. So they threw him in the lion's den. Now, they didn't have the punishment that Daniel had to be eaten up by the lions. They just assumed that the lions would eat when they're hungry, a person who's in the lion's den. So the king said, Daniel, I don't want to do this. But he said, King, you got to keep your word. I'm going to keep my word. God's keeping his word. Put me in the lion's den. I'll be just fine. 
And when Daniel was in the lion's den, he used the lions as pillows and they couldn't eat him. The king got up the next morning and said, Daniel, Daniel, the God whom you serve faithfully, did he keep you alive? And Daniel said, oh, king, live forever. God sent his angel and closed the, clothed, the, closed the lion's mouths so that they have no harm on me. And the king was like, you know what? This is why I promoted you. This is why you're in leadership. This is why when they had a petition for you to be persecuted for praying to the living God and you went in your balcony area of your palace, Daniel, and you opened the doors and you let everybody who wanted to see, but you weren't doing it for their pleasure. You were facing towards Israel and you were praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Daniel, because you did it without embarrassment, because you did it boldly, and you did it without concern of the consequences. You kept your faithful commitment to God to pray. It doesn't surprise me, O Daniel, that your God took care of you in this situation. See, when you're known to be a person of prayer, and things start popping off for you and you're getting results. And there'll be people that they curse Jesus. They talk about Jesus. They talk about you for coming to church. They talk about you for getting into the word. They're like, do you really think I want to go to church with you? But let something go down of a tragedy. Let something happen where everything that they know about it is in jeopardy. Who do they come to? Oh, excuse me. I need you to pray. I need you to pray. Like, for example, where I lived, there was a person, the young lady, she was looking after her dad. Her dad literally died. The police, I mean, you know, the police and which were the sheriffs and the and the um, fire department was there. The paramedics were there. And I and I came to the house and they were like getting ready to write down the time of death. And I said, do you mind if I pray? They said, uh, well, the person's dead. I said, do you mind if I pray? They said, well, you know, don't get in our way, but yeah, okay, take a, go ahead. And I went over and prayed, and he came back to life. And when he came back to life, they were like, they looked at each other. But the young lady, who was his, the young lady's daughter, she was like, all the time I've been talking bad about you and telling you I'm not going to come to church and all that stuff, and I'm not going to, you know, receive Jesus. But that young lady said, uh, you can't argue with the results. See, when people are being raised from the dead because you choose to pray, and when I say you choose to pray, you love people, but you're not doing it of your own ability. You're doing it because Jesus said, whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to you. And the person requested it. They had no other option as far as they were concerned, either that or just let their dad be gone and let the time of his death be, be recorded. But they recognized there was an option. There's somebody who knows God. There's somebody who's willing to pray. There's somebody who God listens to. Now, I'm not bragging on me in any shape, form, or fashion. I'm bragging on this covenant we have with our Father God in the name of Jesus. And what he does for me, he'll do for you. Why? Because we're all the same children of God in Christ Jesus. But there are those under the Old Testament who knew. They knew. They knew when they prayed under their covenant, Abrahamic covenant. They knew if I pray, hey, God's going to hear me. So then you, gotta, you, have, you have to evaluate under the Old Testament. There's a scripture about Job. Did you know there's a book in the Bible under the Old Testament called Job, J-O-B, right? He was a prophet. God gave Job a response. I mean, not Job. Job. Who am I thinking about, Lord? Jonah. I'm going to talk, talk about Jonah. Job is good, but I want to talk about Jonah now. Jonah, he was the guy who was swallowed up by the great fish, right? Also known as the whale. So Jonah was told by God, God told Jonah, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to the people and let them know I've got to move in judgment if they don't repent. 
And Jonah's like, I tell you what, God, these people have been evil to us as Jews. I ain't trying to have that. They've, they've done all kinds of atrocities. If there's any race of people I don't like, it's the Ninevites. I'm out of here. In fact, Jonah said, I'm going to Tarsus. I'm getting the cruise ship to go to Tarsus and vacation. God said, go to Nineveh and preach a word of repentance to the people. Jonah said, I tell you what, I'm going to Tarsus. So he gets on the ship to go to Tarsus. While he's on the ship, the, the ship is going through all of this turmoil and the waves are coming against it and the storm is, tum is tumultuous. It's like a hurricane just rose up and was getting, it, the ship was in jeopardy. And the captain of the ship being a mariner, he was a Gentile, a non-Jew, he said, everybody get your idol gods, get up on the deck here, everybody pray. And everybody was on the deck except one person. And the storm was still raging. And he said, I got somebody missing. Clerk, tell me who's missing. That young, that guy Jonah, he's missing. He said, well, would you go get him and tell him to show up on deck and bring his idol God? Jonah comes on the deck. He's not carrying any idol God. Jonah is on the deck there, and the captain says, and didn't I command everybody to pray? Because we need to live, and it looks like we're getting ready to die. I want everybody praying right now. I'm the captain of this ship. And Jonah said, I ain't praying. He said, I said pray. Do you not know that your life is in my hand? I could have you off the gangplank and drowned in the sea here. I'm telling you, either you pray or I'm throwing you out. And Jonah said, throw me out because I ain't praying. Now, I'm not bragging about the man's hard-hearted attitude, but I'm letting you know, he must have known something about the power of prayer. See, he knew if I do pray, God's going to hear me. And me and God ain't seeing eye to eye on what he wants done. He wants these Ninevite people to repent and he could work in bringing them to a place of blessings. And I ain't feeling that at all. And therefore, I'm not going to do what God told me to do. And the captain said, well, who is your God? And Jonah said, my God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. My God is the one that created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that in them is. He said, that's your God? He said, yeah, that's my God. Is that the reason why you don't have an idol on deck here and you're not doing all kinds of things to try to be religious? That's right, because my God is real. And he hears me when I pray and I ain't praying. So the captain said, well, what do you want me to do? And Jonah said, well, throw me over because I don't mind dying. You know, that's a, that's a different kind of personality, but you ought to read the book of Jonah. That's the personality that Jonah had. Once he made up in his mind, that's what he wanted to do. That's what he was going to do. And he knew that prayer worked. He knew that if he prayed, God would work on behalf of his prayer. And Jonah knew that if he preached, the people may repent. And Jonah's like, I know about the power of words and I am not going to pray. So the captain said, look, bind him up or not bind him, but just grab him, throw him overboard. But he said, God, the God of Jonah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, lay not this man's, his, his blood on my hands. He's the one that said, throw me over. I'm throwing him over. You apparently are not pleased with him, and I need protection for me and my crew. I got a job to do, and I need to get, it, I need to get a successful journey here. So I'm taking the troublemaker and I'm throwing him out. And Jonah was thrown in the water. And Jonah's like, oh, I'm ready to die as long as I don't do what God wants me to do. Well, you know how God is. God gets the last laugh, doesn't he? And God is God, isn't he? A great fish came and got him, swallowed him, and Jonah's in the belly of the whale. Now, some people say, oh, it's not possible. Look, I've watched enough science programs to know it is possible. 
It is very, very possible. In fact, Jonah was in the belly of the whale. And while he's in the belly of the whale going up and down in the in the different highs and lows of the oceans there and the depths and the gastric juices and all the stuff that's going on. Jonah is like, I'm I'm dying in here. I'm dying here. See, he wanted to die quickly, but you he couldn't even die. So he's in the belly of the well and as the acids are eating on his skin and everything and as he's there in the belly, he's like, I think I need to change my mind. All right, God. Okay, God. All right. I I repent. I repent. I repent. I repent. All right, Lord, I will go do what you asked me to do. And then he made the statement. Turn over and look at this. Jonah chapter two in the Bible. There's a book called Jonah. Turn over there. Let's look at that. Chapter two. In Jonah, the second chapter, and I know it's somewhere in here. I got it in my Bible somewhere. It's not very often that we go have to go to something real quick like this. But anyway, Jonah, where is it? It's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. What page is it on, Minister Me Bang? I'm just, <laughs> come on, y'all. What's that? Obadiah, right after Obadiah, right? Okay, All right, here it is. There it is, Jonah chapter two, just like I said. Okay. Jonah chapter two, verse one. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. And he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou heardst my voice. For thou hast... For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about, even to the soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped around about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee, into thy holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercies or their own mercy. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. In other words, I got a change of mind. All right, I'm going to do what I said I would do. I said I'd be your mouthpiece, and now I'm going to pray. And now when I pray, I'm not going to look at the circumstances that I'm involving that's all around me. Why? Because those that look at the circumstances push away their own mercies or the goodness and the love of God. I'm not going to talk about the condition I'm in because talking about that, you already know about. But what I will do, O Lord, I will now pray to you and ask you to deliver me for you are my salvation. And the fish that he was in took him to Nineveh, coughed him up, and he went in there and preached. And what happened? The people repented just like he thought they would. And then he gets upset because the people repented. And while he's while he's upset because the people repented and judgment has not come upon Nineveh, Jonah is like, oh, man, I can't stay in the city with all these people. I can't stand these folks. And they repented. And the king made a decree there in Nineveh that everybody had to fast. And then he Jonah's like, I'm getting the distance away from these people. And you know what? Jonah said, I got to find a shady spot. Now, why do you have to find a shady spot? Because the acids of the well or the fish had eaten up the protective layer of his skin. So basically, he looked like a hot mess. So he goes and sits underneath a tree, a gourd tree. And while he's there in the shade, he's upset and looking at the city and everything is going on better than it was before. He's upset, but yet he knows, oh, okay, I'm trying, I'm at least getting some kind of comfort from being underneath the shade tree. Then the shade tree, there's a worm that 
kills the shade tree and it all begins to take away his shade. Everything is dying on the tree and he, he, can't, he can't get any shade anymore. And he's in a sun exposed environment and now his skin is hurting him because he, remember what happened to his skin. And he's upset. He's like, God, see, I knew you were going to save the people. I knew that you would do your mercy and your goodness. And God said to him, what's wrong, Jonah? Jonah said, why can't I just get a little shade tree? I mean, after all, I am hurting in this sun. And God said, oh, it's an interesting thing that you'd like to get some comfort from the shade. And you're upset about the tree being dead. But what about all those kids and the husbands and the wives and the animals that were in Nineveh? Do you not have any compassion for them, Jonah? And then the story ends. So you say, well, I don't need prayer. I'm good. But what about your ability to pray for others? Does that affect you? Or are you like Jonah, I do what I want to do, God. Don't bother me. I'm too busy doing my thing. Thing, thing. It's necessary that you be a person who knows how to pray. And we're going to be covering more of this, how to pray effectively. We're going to now take communion. I want to thank you for tuning in today's lesson. If you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then I'm going to lead you into a confession of faith. If you say these words after me, you can become a child of the living God. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Let us pray these words now, believing these words in our heart and saying them with our mouth. Dear God, I believe in my heart you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for my sins. He was crucified. His blood was shed to wash me clean. And dear God, you raised him from the dead. So I confess with my mouth now, Jesus, you are my Lord and Savior. You are alive. I believe this in my heart. And because I confess you as my Lord, I am now a child of the living God. Father, thank you for making me your very own. I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to thank you for your continual support of this broadcast of Spirit Food Christian Center. We're so grateful for your participation. I'd like to give you an opportunity to participate by our Push Pay app. Text my SFCC to the number 77977. You'll receive further instruction on how to give. We're so grateful and thankful for your continual support and love. Remember, you're helping to make it happen. In Jesus' name, you amen. Are the sun.